So our final session of the day is uh, advocacy and action. Um, and on this panel, we have many people living with neuromuscular disorders who have had to advocate throughout their adult life um, in, in many ways. Um, so I'm not gonna introduce everyone individually because I feel like this panel is really about telling everyone's stories. And I think that the best person to do that is each of you yourself. So I think um, if we just jump in right into the panel um, and if everyone kind of wants to introduce themselves um, and kind of explain a little bit about what your advocacy journey has been like through um, either through the transition from pediatric to adult life or just, just in the adult system in general. Uh, do we want to start with Kyle maybe? Yeah, hi. Um, again, my name is Kyle. I uh, hope everyone's having a wonderful time at the conference. Um, so I have um, neuro a neuromuscular disease called spinal muscular atrophy. And uh, my advocacy started basically as I transitioned from uh, a child to, to an adult um, in, in the medical world. And basically, uh, with the new treatment coming with um, SMA, it's becoming a little difficult because I live in Ontario. Um, you know, to get to get approval for funding for the for the medication. So basically, you know, I'm con you know, it, it feels like sometimes it's like a full time job. So you have to constantly call and call and call and um, to to see where everything is at and and always you know, keeping update with your doctor and, and asking a lot of questions like that. But one of the major things that I found was during the transition is I kind of got lost in the system. So when I transitioned from the medical, uh, from the child world to the adult world is that I didn't have a neurologist. I just had a rehab specialist and that was my huge mistake. And because I didn't have a neurologist that specialized with neuromuscular diseases, I lost track of a lot of uh, trials, uh, a lot of information. I didn't get that until later on uh, when you know I, I, I could have jumped on. So I think you know that's that's one of the major experiences that I found is that you, know, you can get lost in the system. So you have to keep with it you have to keep up doing your own research uh making your own phone calls um it, it can be you know daunting at times but um you know hopefully it will pay off uh with all the effort uh i know for me uh, you know i did was able to get on a couple of trials in montreal and um you know upwards and upwards so that's a, a little bio in my advocacy and uh, i'll be happy to answer any of your questions Thank you, Kyle. Um, Shailen, maybe we can head over to you next. I know you have a lot of similar experiences advocating for treatment and clinical trials. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, definitely. Um, so I'm Shailen, I'm 26 and I have SMA type two. Um, in 2018, I started advocating for um, funding for Spinraza as it had been like almost a year since Health Canada approved it and there was no funding. Um, I also at the same time was advocating to get um, a clinical trial for RISDABLAM either to Canada um, or able to enter a site in the US. Um, and so, yeah, it was a lot of, as Kyle said, phone calls, um, meetings, it was, uh, it was about an eight month process before I was allowed to purchase um, Spinraza out of pocket. And we purchased four doses in order for me to qualify for the clinical trial for Rizdaplam um, based in New York. And so um, I've now been on that trial for three years. But prior to that, I had also done a cytokinetics trial. Um, and in all cases, I really found definitely the gap um, going from youth to adult services. And so all of those I found I had to find on my own, um, apply for on my own, bring what the doctor was required to fill out to the doctor. 
Um, I never really had any of my medical team looking into these kinds of things. And so, yeah, it was a long process and I was able to get Spinraza covered um, for all ages in Saskatchewan, which is where I'm from. Um, and I know that lots of provinces are still dealing with that fight. And yeah, I think that really my main key to advocacy has been that you, you can't fight alone. Like you need everybody coming together um, to avoid burnout, to strengthen your message. And yeah, the government, it's against our human rights that some people in some provinces can access treatment and some can't. Um, and so, yeah, I totally get how tiring advocacy can be and have had to take breaks myself, but um, yeah, that's kind of my background. Thanks, Shayla. Um, Jeff, do you want to go next? Thanks, Terry. So I also had an advocacy journey about uh, getting access to the basic plan, which I'm currently on. But maybe I'll take a different perspective. My biggest advocacy journey has been around access to caregiving. So I was very lucky that my parents were really strong advocates. And so I really have all the resources I need until I finished university. But then when I graduated, I had to move away for a career. So I moved from the Rugby to Ontario. Great services in Ontario. But when I moved back home after being laid off in New Brunswick, I had to start from scratch. So I went from being completely independent to moving back home, living with my parents, doing the majority of my care. So I started that journey right away. I met with several levels of government officials. I worked with partner organizations like Muscular Dystrophy, other disability support organizations in my community to build my, my strength in self-advocacy. And I think from my perspective, what really led to my success was being able to talk using the words and language of those making the decisions. So I made a complete business case for why it made sense for the government to provide the care I needed. When I did that, it worked. So it really was about communicating in ways that others are going to understand. And, and unfortunately, at the end of the day, when, when it comes to these types of services, everything is about money. And so we need to be able to understand the economic impact of them providing us these services. Thanks, Jeff. Um, Jeff, do you want to go next? Yeah, I mean, I can speak to, you know, myself as an advocate for just my care when it comes to attending care. You know, uh, I've, you know, and I can imagine this is really some experience that many of you probably have faced, but, you know, advocating for your needs when it comes to the care that you need. I mean, you know, I think it's very important. I think for those of you who are not on self-managed care, for those of you receiving agency care, for those receiving care from providers, I think it's very important that you communicate what you're really, what you need to them. Um, you know, I think it's very important that you, you get your needs addressed. And I think, you know, unfortunately, in some instances, it may not be that easy. And, you know, I can imagine there are limited resources in other parts of the country. Um, so I, I can appreciate that. But I think, you know, it's very important that, you know, speaking up when it comes to that, I think it's very important to speak up when it comes to your, you know, to your care in general. I, you know, I can, I can relate a story of me being in a hospital one time uh, last year and, and with, you know, with, and as many as you know, people with neuromuscular disorders have trouble with anesthesia, right? And, you know, I think, you know, there's a gap there with respect to adult care that needs to be met. I think a gap in, in, in that setting. So I think more than ever, we, we need people to, to push for that, to advocate for, you know, those specific needs to be met. So, I, you know, so I guess the point I'm getting at is, you know, be pushy to the extent that you can be pushy. You know, know what your needs are and and don't be afraid to echo them. And I know it's easier said than done, but at the end of the day, it's 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 your health and and it's very important that you know you speak up unfortunately to get to get what you need. Um Stephanie, do you want to go next? 
So um, I'm not going to talk about uh, something that I've, I've personally done, but I guess I've, I do do this in general. But I think one of the things that uh, you have to be basically the manager of your own healthcare needs um, and understand that, you know, oftentimes, I, I actually will give an example, um, you know, my general practitioner um, would would uh, refer me to someone uh, because I had an issue that uh, required surgery. I knew very well that that person was not going to be qualified once I met with them. They were very new to uh, that uh, type of surgery. Um, and they, you know, looked at me with like a deer in headlights. They didn't know what they were going, they were getting themselves into. So I quickly realized that uh, as was discussed in one of the earlier uh, sessions that, you know, we can also search out and ask to be referred to specific doctors. We have those kinds of abilities when it comes to our own health and well-being. So, I mean, this is an important thing that everyone has to understand that um, you are technically the manager of your health care. The healthcare system um, was not made for people who um, have disabilities. I hate to say that, but it's not. Everyone probably knows just by walking into or rolling into a, a hospital, they, were, they did not have people with disabilities in mind. Obviously things are changing, but we also have to remember that doctors are, are people. So they're not um, better than you. You can ask them questions and, and say no. Uh, two things if you if it uh, is inappropriate for you. Uh, I do need uh, to go to an x-ray that has wheelchair accessibility. I need these things. These are things that I, I cannot live without. And sometimes we have to be the educators of our own full con first contact physicians. And it can be very, very tiresome and very daunting because sometimes they don't necessarily think that we understand our bodies as much as we really do because we're living in them. And I think that everybody can probably uh, resound with that, that uh, we know, you know ourselves, you know if something's wrong and you know, they were telling me for a while, didn't look like anything. Well, it was something. So just that one of the points that um, to be sure to, uh, if something you outside of SMA I'm speaking about uh, occurs, um, and you don't take no for an answer. I'll give another anecdote different. I had to go for a mammogram, my first mammogram, uh, because I, when I turned 50, they were going to deny me a mammogram because they thought that a person with a disability, it wasn't going to be, it was gonna to be too difficult. So I had to actually do my own advocacy in terms of determining how is a mammogram done, where is the accessible places, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and sometimes it is overwhelming and it will only get more overwhelming as you guys get older. Uh, so uh, it's better to know and be confident in talking your, speaking your mind to your doctors and first front care line workers uh, now. Thanks. Thanks for sharing that, Stephanie. Um, Jared, do you wanna go next? Sure. Um, so I am Jared, you've probably seen me around here a bit today. Um, I am 33 and I live in Ontario. Uh, I will kind of give you a bit of a Coles notes onto some of the advocating I guess I've been doing lately. I, like I said, I'm 33. I put my application in to access uh, Spinraza uh, in, I believe it was late 2018, very early 2019. Um, I did not hear anything back um, at the same time. I had heard of a couple other colleagues um, the hearing, hearing back uh, one way or another, whether they were going to get um, coverage or approval. Um, I, I still have not heard back to this day to make a long story short. Um, so in these last three, three and a half years, we've done everything from petitions to letters to newspaper articles to podcasts to to features any basically anywhere you can name it uh, we had a petition with eight, 18,000 signatures basically saying give, give adults equal access to 
to these drugs, to these treatments. And um, it's a fight that's been, that's been really frustrating at times because a lot of times it, there are no answers. And, and even though people tell you that they're working behind the scenes on things and, and that things are going with, without seeing any tangible proof, it, 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 it will get you down a little bit. Um, so I've been lucky enough to to be working with my my MPPs here in in Niagara and and some of my colleagues with SMA who who have access treatment have have helped direct me down the right roads and put me in contact with some of the right people. But um, up until up until today, we're still we're still going, and I still. I still have no answers when it when it when it comes to this, and and I'm lucky that I can rely on organizations like MDC uh, to to help guide me wherever I need to go next. And I, yeah, this is important for me to have access to treatment. I'm 33. I have a baby on the way in January. This these treatments are, are potentially the difference of me holding my baby now, two years down the road, three years down the road things like that. Uh, not only that, they're the difference of me being able to, to grab a cup, to feed myself, to, to bathe myself, to, to clothe myself as much as I can now. And it's so time sensitive. And I, I feel like a lot of times that's lost on these people who are the making the decisions is that for people like us, every day, every, every week, every month that goes by is, is a big, is a big, big difference. If you look at, if I look at my progression three years ago to, to where I am now, when I first applied, I, I, and I'm not saying this would work. I'm not saying treatment's going to work. We don't know how everybody's going to react to it, but I can only imagine if, if I would have got that treatment three years ago, or if that treatment was even available when I, I got diagnosed at, at 13, uh, and to, to be here almost 20 years later with, with nothing is, is disheartening, but I've I've kind of said it this whole time through these this um, these sessions today is that by doing this and, and it's one of the reasons that I continue to do these and it's one of the reasons that I think we all do is because access to, at, at the end of the day treatment is uh, and and our care is, is huge that's that's one of the biggest things and we all deserve access to that regardless of where you're living regardless of of how much money you have regardless of how old you are we need that and I think that's that's what we're all here to do today is to, is to keep fighting and to show people that we keep fighting and we're not going away quietly I'm not I, I know none of you are um, so yeah we'll we'll get there we're close we're close we're closer than we've ever been so that's that's my journey so far thanks Sarah um, Noma do you want to share your experiences yeah so um I would say like uh, I uh, I have always to advocate for myself on an individual level and with organizations like uh, QRSME Canada for access to treatments. For myself, I found myself always um, in need to advocate to get the right piece of equipment to uh, get some uh, medical services tailored to my own need because I am different. Um, it was hard also to uh, get referrals sometimes to some of the specialized services. Uh, either the referrals were denied or like, why would you need that? Um, I had also, as uh, Stephanie said, like educate others. Uh, sometimes emerge doctors, like they would ask me, isn't that related to SMA, for example? And he's a doctor and I'm the patient, but I have to tell him what's related to SMA and not. And the big challenge is that sometimes when we, when I go with um, some kind of medical complaint, uh, they tend to throw it immediately on SMA and they don't think of something else. Like, ah, I might have some SMA, but I may also develop other issues. So it's a constant, like I have to be mentally present and involved in every single step. And that is tiring. It is very tiring. Um, of course, I had to uh, advocate also uh, sometimes like with other things that are not medical, like fair treatment uh, by the employer. Uh, that was also a, a difficult uh, fight. 
uh, thankfully I'm on. Uh, also, I, um, I advocate for my clients because I am a care um, social worker and I'm a care coordinator. So sometimes just they like I advocate uh, for them to get approval on certain things because there was some kind of broken communications between the vendor, the OT, and the ODSP worker who, who, who denied, for example, certain kind of funding. Um, I had to advocate with landlords sometimes to, to accommodate clients also. So it seems like um, uh, it's every day, every single day, either for myself or for, for my clients or for the bigger group, uh, mainly the SMA group. Uh, at times, I just want to take a break to recharge my battery. Uh, sometimes I have to just reprioritize the to-do list because it's too much sometimes to do everything. And sometimes, hey, enough is enough. I need someone to speak on my behalf. Uh, I'm tired of that. And I did it once because like, it was very, very difficult. And I don't mind doing it again when needed. Thank you, Noma. Um, and thank you to everyone that shared their stories. Um, I think it's really important for, for people to hear, especially as they're making that transition into adulthood, hear from those of us who have had to advocate um, and you know, letting everyone know that they are not alone in their advocacy journey. Um, I do want to get to some questions since we are very limited on time for this session. Um, Jeff and Khalid, I noticed you had your hands up. Um, did you want to jump in and say anything before we move to questions? Yeah, yeah, just just quickly following up on um, what um, Numa and Stephanie said about managing your own health care. It's probably the most important thing in my life because the health is really vital to, to everything that we do. And part of something else I've learned a lot in the last year is that sometimes when we're in the hospital, we need to be our own self-advocate, but because we're ill, we're not able to. So I, I developed the, a, a, an intensive and emergency care plan that has been documented for myself that I carry with me. And in this past year, I ended up in the emergency room surgery and the ICU for some health issues. And because I had that plan in place, I didn't get any sicker, which normally happens when I'm in the hospital. And I was able to have my caregivers both in the operating room and in the ICU with me. And so it's just re really important not only to, when you have your plan, don't keep it to yourself, but everyone in your circle know what your wants are, what your needs are, and have it in writing so that you can have that with you to share with the professionals and that they can read it when you're in those situations. And Khalid, do you want to add something? Yeah. yeah, I just want to first off say, what I'm hearing is absolutely wonderful. I mean, Jared, Numa, I know, you know, it sounds like you really are, you know, pushing forward. And I know it can be tiring at times. And I know it can be a bit frustrating at times. And so I just come in everyone. It's not an easy thing to live with. And I, you know, I think, you know, hopefully, you know, as we speak more about it, these issues, you know, become more noticeable and, and we don't have to deal with it as much in the future. So, you know, uh, what I want to get at is that, you know, um, very important as I was mentioning throughout the day, you know, just have your, you know, it's it's important to be on top of your care, but, you know, keep keep others in the loop. You know, uh, I think it's very important to have support and allies to help you advocate, right? I think it's very important that you link to resources, link to others, link to family members to help, to help you with that, because it can be a very straining battle on your own. I can tell you firsthand. Right. So, you know, uh, you're not you're not necessarily advocate, but, you know, uh, allow others in. I think it's very important to keep others a private situation. And I think even family members, I think, you know, in the event of an emergency situation, keep them aware of what your, you know, what your wishes are. Right. You know, it's very important that you communicate that with people around you and let people in. It's 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 a very scary battle to go on your own and you don't want to end up in a surgery right? so you just on your own. So you want to have others there with you helping you along the way. So, you know, don't be afraid to, to let others in is what I'm trying to get at here. Yeah, 
definitely. Um, I'm just going to hand it over to Hamira, just to oh. being mindful of time. I think we have a couple of questions. Can I just give one piece of advice? Yeah, I literally ahead. have in my home, in my bathroom, because that's the first place I go, poster called Keep Calm and Carry On, because every day, uh, I know we advocate for our health, but I know that I feel some, it's every day we have to get up, calm down and keep on going. That's, uh, uh, that's what I do. And I hope that uh, it helps someone else. I think this is quite similar. The, the uh, common theme in, in the chat box that I am seeing is uh, comments around stress, anxiety, guilt, burnout. Um, but it was a question actually posed to you, Shaylin, around guilt of um, how, you know, this person has also access treatment for their uh, neuromuscular condition. And as they hear about others still advocating for access to treatment in other provinces, they feel guilt. Um, are you able to relate to that or speak to that, Shaylin? Definitely. Um, that's been a huge struggle for me in my advocacy since I access treatment. Um, there's a ton of guilt that comes with accessing it and knowing others are still fighting so hard trying to. Um, it's, it's hard to wanna talk about the improvements of the treatment when you know that there's so many people who can't experience that right now. And I think that because our, especially in Canada, our government's set up the way it is, that each province is funded separately, it really creates a divide in our community as well. Um, and yeah, I, I honestly had quite a few people who I was friends with in the community that um, will no longer talk to me because of the path I took. And it's this is the first conference I've come back to since, um, since getting treatment because it's, it's very hard to hear, um, yeah, that there's, there, it feels like there's no way to help um, everyone access it. And it's a very, it's very discouraging and awful that um, we have to sit here divided like that when there's one treatment that would help so many of us. Thanks for sharing that, Jalen. Um, yeah, I think, I think it's really, sad that sometimes advocacy does divide us as a community um and yeah i just think that's really challenging but i'm really proud of you on the path that you've taken and honestly everyone here you've done such an amazing job at advocating um and thank you for sharing your stories um jared do you want to say a final note before we hand off this session i just wanted to jump in real quick onto what Shay Lynn just said um, as somebody who doesn't have access to treatment and has a lot of colleagues who do have access to treatment is that like I and this is me personally and I can't speak for everybody but I I personally love seeing everything that that you all are doing and I love I love the fact that you have access to it it gives me hope for myself and and other people without it that that it's out there and that people are getting it and I don't think anything in life really starts with a tidal wave of everything coming one's way it takes people like yourself it takes people like Tori to really get this ball rolling and um I I mean I think it's it's their loss if people are taking it that way I think it's a completely wrong way to go about something especially in a community like ours and that's it's a little disheartening to hear that but I, I really like what, what we've built here and what we've got going. So I just wanted to put that in. Thanks. I really appreciate hearing um, that perspective. And yeah, I do want to give Tori a shout out because although she's moderating right now, Tori has done an insane amount of advocating and I wouldn't be where I am without what Tori's done. So. Thank you. Thank you, Shailen. Um, I think that you kind of made me feel very comfortable in my advocacy journey with accessing treatment. Um, you know, you were one of the first comedians that I saw um, putting your story out there and doing it. So I want to thank you as well for like paving the way for all of us. Um, and yeah, it, it has really changed everything for 
everyone with SMA trying to access treatment in Canada. I know that sometimes it feels like by sharing our stories that we're only helping ourselves, but I think that's the farthest from the truth. We are furthering it for everyone living with SMA. So thank you, Shailen. And I think that that is unfortunately the end of this amazing panel. Um,